I promise by the cup, the sword, the coin, and the wand, Winter Carlyle said, her cracking voice committing ancient symbols to modern wires, which delivered them through Laura's listening ear into her reasoning mind. Like her brother, she was, for a moment, part of a machine. Is it hard? she asked. Very hard, but not too hard, Mrs. Carlyle replied. It changes you forever, but you are changing forever anyway. That was from Margaret Mahi's The Changeover, and this is The Red Pen. Welcome back to The Red Pen, where we cut up fiction to see what it's made of. I am your host, Amanda Jean, and I am joined by... Your other host, Austin Chant. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Austin. For the second time. I'm good. For the second time. Let's talk over each other even more. I love it. podcast material. Yeah. (laughs) It's great. Uh, Yeah, we're recording this for the second time because Amanda was sick when we recorded the first time, uh, and it just didn't come out to our satisfaction. It really didn't. Apologies for the delay, but we want to make sure we're giving you that sweet, hot, quality audio content. uh, (laughs) That erotic audio content that that you crave. That erotic audio content that we we do. Uh, (laughs) So, yeah. So we're back. And Amanda, why don't you tell us what this episode's going to be about? Well, this episode is about the supernatural YA romance, um, (laughs) The Changeover by Margaret Mahi who was an acclaimed um, children's and young adult author, passed a couple of years ago, which I'm really bummed about. But that's okay, because we have her beautiful legacy of works to sustain us. And this is my favorite of them that that I've read. She has much more than I've not read. (laughs) Maybe there's another one I like better than The Changeover, but I can't imagine that that is true. I just realized we're on a little bit of a YA streak. We really are, aren't we? Ah, Yeah. That's unusual for me and I think for you as well. Yeah, I, I have like very specific young adult authors that I absolutely love and then don't read a, a ton of YA aside from that. No, nothing wrong with YA. I'm just normally in the fucky romance yeah. category. I read podcast. a lot of fucky fiction. Very, so. Podcast? What? <laughs> <laughs> Is this your week to be slightly off while we record? Listen, sometimes you just say words. And you're not too bothered about what words they're going to be until they come out of your mouth. And then you have to consider the consequences. That's how I live my life, moment to moment. Surprise (laughs) word, surprise word. (laughs) I wish I were kidding about that, but it's kind of true. As we mentioned, we had sort of a failure attempt at this. Uh, The biggest change between now and then, aside from the fact that I'm not sick anymore and don't have like scrambled NyQuil brain, is that Austin has started reading the book, which he hadn't initially. So he may have more than three things to say about it the entire recording. (laughs) Well, that's a a stretch. I'm just going to sort of speak. um, When the mood takes you? When when the mood takes me, yes. (laughs) When the mood takes your (laughs) co-host. That's a podcast. (laughs) What is the moon taking me to do? What is the moon doing to me? (laughs) It's making you speak. (laughs) Okay. It has that power. Also, Austin and I may be a little bit silly because we are snowed in in our respective apartments. Yeah, uh, we're having sort of a a winter wonderland vibe and looking out at the the puffy flakes coming down this is this will come out hopefully when we're no longer snowed in it although might, who knows it might actually who come knows? out while we're still snowed in we're currently in the middle of seattle snowpocalypse 2019 which if you haven't heard is maybe we don't know yet going to be the biggest storm since winter the 90s. storm well since 2008 no they said since the 90s no, well, they're least, wrong. You know, 2008 was pretty bad. <laughs> I wasn't here then, so I will defer to you. 2008, we got like two feet of snow. The city was swallowed up. It was. It ceased to be a city. It's pretty bad now. I ordered groceries from an app, and this was days ago. And I placed the order like three days before they actually had an opening, which is very unusual for this app. You can usually get it within like three hours. I had put, you know, some stuff that I thought 
oh, I'm going to get some cereal and I'll just eat a lot of cereal because that's always a good quick thing. And if the power goes out, I'll be able to have it. I put in like, get me some milk. And the dude was like, they're out of milk. And um, <laughs> so I basically argued with him via the app and not actually texting him by like putting different brands of milk in <laughs> just like, okay, they're out of the generic. How about this? How about this brand of milk? Until eventually I just gave up and was like, oh, okay, it is about to be snowpocalypse. And there has been a lot of tittering on the internet about Seattleites um, not being able to prepare properly for the snow um, because apparently, like, PCC sold a lot of avocados. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us alone. That is a staple. It's not for me, but I understand it. Also, PCC is not where I would go to stock up on snow essentials. No, but it is where my family would have gone back in the day. So, yeah, you wasp I motherfuckers. The, the bougie habits of the the bouge. The bouge. Uh, <laughs> the Seattle tech. Nowadays, people. I've, I go to Bartell after I flee from work. <laughs> I literally, so I, I work in the downtown Seattle area and we had to come into work. There was such a strong winter storm warning that like the schools had all shut down preemptively. And so we were like, this is going to happen. So at noon, I was like, listen, can Bye. I just go home? over my lunch break and they were like yeah okay and literally in the 10 minutes it took me to walk from work to the bus stop the snow just starts dumping yeah it was and rough. it took me two hours to get home because it was already too late they had to stop and put chains on the buses and they had to do that with all of the buses simultaneously so it was just a row of buses stuck in the street the thing about seattle that i feel like people who are not from here don't get is this is truly not an apocalyptic amount of snow no we have maybe four inches down so far. Yeah, four or five uh, right now. Four or five. Like, if you're just walking through it, that's fine. However, Seattle is made of exclusively hills. It's all hills up and, and down. there's no infrastructure for snow. Yeah, all up and down, really, really, really steep, horrifying hills. And also because it's so not, it's not super cold here. We're not, we're getting down to like just barely below freezing and kind of fluctuating up and down. So what we're getting is snow that melts and freezes into ice and then a little layer of snow on top just to deceive you. And then that melts and freezes into ice, little snow on top. So what you really have is just black ice Slip covering every road with a tiny bit of snow on top so you don't see it until you step on it and fall and die. Yeah, it's rough. It's brutal. And that's why <laughs> the snow sucks in Seattle. And you live near hills so even getting to the bus stop is just the most precarious could end in a head injury like it's bad so i on one hand am amused by the sheer amount of panic that four inches has wrought upon this whole city but also completely understand it because i'm not taking my little tiny korean car anywhere like i can't it'll spin out <laughs> this this length of a snowstorm we have no ability to to handle because it again it happens like once every 10 years decade yeah <laughs> like occasionally we'll get like some snow and it'll stick for two days and we're like oh my god it snowed it, it snowed, snowed. <gasps> and then it it usually it melts but this is a problem because it's just not it's turning into ice and then the snow is gonna stick around yeah so anyway, um, we're trapped. We're trapped. Um, People like avocados. I couldn't get milk to go with my beautiful... I bought two boxes of cereal, so I have two boxes of dry cereal with a little bit of milk left. I am really uh, extremely set as long as the power doesn't go out. If the power goes out, I'm going to die. Yeah, it's... <laughs> because I can cook all day. I have, like, enough pancake mix and just flour eat the pancake to mix. just sort of do whatever I, I need to survive. But it, if my power goes out, I'm going to be sitting here, like, eating my indoor plants. Uh, I have I have some easy stuff to make. I do have a lot of, like, uh, some packets of, like, ramen. And I guess I could eat the dry ramen. Can you eat aloe? That'll be yes. my last resort because I don't want to eat my aloe plant. It doesn't taste but do good, have but that. you can I, eat it. I imagine that it tastes really bad. It's bitter. You have to cut the – I mean, obviously, you can't eat the leaf itself. You have to eat the inner aloe part. You can't yeah. eat the – I mean, I, maybe you can eat it. I don't know. But like, don't just eat the inside slimy bit. Well, we're set to record our next episode during still snowpocalypse Seattle you'll 2019. You'll get an update. Yeah, you'll, you'll find out how we're doing. You'll, you'll find out how we're doing and we won't talk about it for five minutes next time. How about yes. that? <laughs> <laughs> 2.5 2. minutes max.
having said all of that, welcome back. We're here to talk about The Changeover, which is my favorite YA book of all time. And yeah. it was published in 1984, so it's a little old. It's set in New Zealand um, because Margaret Mahi was also a New Zealander. I don't know. I just, I love it top to bottom. It is about a 14-year-old girl named Laura Chant who essentially goes on a magical quest to save her brother who has Sorry, been- Sorry, Chant, eh? Yeah, right? I was like, I figured you <laughs> might like Laura. <laughs> My sister. <laughs> That'd be amazing. I want you to be related to Laura Chant. She essentially goes on a- um a quest to save her little brother Jacko from essentially a demon. Um, and what the, one of the reasons why I picked this, aside from the fact that I love it and am happy to talk about it at any time, my friend B gave it to me and I read it. I inhaled it in like two and a half hours, three hours, one night. It's very easy to read. The reason why I picked it specifically is because I think it does a lot of really cool things because it has a lot of staples of traditional literary elements and references like fairy tales and folk tales and also a, tr a very common trope um, or metaphor that puberty is witchcraft. But it also subverts them in really interesting ways. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're also going to talk about Sorensen Carlyle, the male love interest, the male witch in the book, because he is my trauma son. And he is also uh, a wonderfully subverted love interest as he is a dude and a witch and not the main character. <laughs> <laughs> For as long as I have known you to talk about this book, it's like, it's a good book, and you like it, and I like all the parts of it. And also, there's the only teen boy in it who matters to me. It's true. Sori, uh, his nickname is Sori, S-O-R-R-Y, short for, of course, Sorensen. Every time he says his name, he apologizes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sori is perfect, and, and by that I mean he is very imperfect. He is a very strange little dude, and um, that's one of the reasons why I love him. And I love that he isn't the main character because he so easily could be in the hands of many authors. But in this, he is ally of Laura's, uh, a challenge to Laura in some ways, um, a catalyst for Laura, but he is not the main character, and I love that. I love that it's plucky 14-year-old Laura Chant trying to save her brother. And also, there was a movie adaptation of it that came out. It hasn't come out in the U.S. yet, but I use Sneaky Wiles and Connections to see it already. But um, Amanda, no. Look, it was perfectly legal, just sneaky. You wouldn't <laughs> steal a... Okay. No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't actually steal it. The uh, the movie adaptation... You wouldn't use sneaky wiles to get a policeman's helmet. <laughs> you wouldn't 3D print a car. Yes, I would. There was a movie adaptation made of it a couple years back, and um, it was actually set not in 1984. It was set in contemporary Christchurch, post-earthquake, obviously. And it was a good movie, but I don't think that it held up compared to the book. It made a lot of weird choices, and it failed to see what was great in the book, which is a lot of what I mentioned, the subversion of fairy tales and the the trope that puberty is witchcraft and how that book engaged with it. So I, I felt like the movie missed the mark, and I'm going to talk about how and why. As usual, I will not spoil the entire book. I will talk generally about the premise, but I will leave like the big stuff un unspoiled because I want people to read it, especially Austin, who needs to finish it. I'll do it. You will do it. You, f you started it. You got past chapter one. I got past like chapter four. Good job. Did you meet Sori? Uh, no. He was the prefect at school. Are you sure? Oh, okay. Yeah, he's there. I mean, I, don't know. I haven't had like a conversation with him. I was like, hello. And he there was he like, is. I'm Sori. And get to school chant. He probably criticized the length of her skirt or something. So I mentioned that Laura Chant is the main character. She's 14. She's a baby. And the book opens on her having sort of a premonition when she's looking in the mirror. She sees herself and, and realizes that she's not quite looking at herself. And she has a history of having had these, these warnings where she knows something's going to go wrong or something big is going to happen. Like, for example, she had one when her dad left. And she is like, okay, well, something bad's going to happen, so I'm kind of primed for that. So immediately you're thrown into this world of Laura Chant, a 14-year-old in pretty average circumstances who who has some sort of window into something preternatural. Could also just, she just has a weird feeling that everybody has a weird feeling from time to time, like, hmm, this feels foreboding. But uh, we're immediately sent into this world of like, Laura's a little sensitive. Laura, Laura has a window into things. I was going to say, I, I actually really like the framing of that as witchcraft too, and specifically the way you phrased that, because teen girls being sensitive is such a weaselly criticism 
yes. of young women. They're too emotional um, or they're too... At like a really emotionally fraught time in anyone's life. And I love having that be not only valid, but also like literally a supernatural power and that sort of being in tune with the world and having empathy for it as, as like, that's magic power right there. Yeah. I like also in the opening scene, she tells her mom, she doesn't keep it a secret. She's like, mom, I had another warning. The Chant family, um, you know, single mom, two kids, not doing too well. Um, they're poor and they're, they're having trouble making ends meet. And the mom's just like in a hurry to get them out the door and get the car started and like figure out what they're going to do about babysitting. Like she's just like, okay, Laura, you know, it's clear that this is a loving relationship, but she's also like, w- okay, <laughs> what are I we going to do about your morning? I can't believe we not only did two weeks of uh, YA, but we did two weeks of Chance. main characters named Chant. Yep. <laughs> this is the Chant podcast. This is with Austin my podcast. Chant. Thank you very much. <laughs> all chant all the time. <laughs> Send in your chant submissions for next week. Honestly, we will legit. talk about who are who are the other chants. Tweet us the chants that you love in fiction, and we'll try and make this a okay. recurring. Theme. Yeah, we'll do it. Again, I don't want to spoil this book too much. So essentially, what happens is she and Jacko, her her little brother, he's I think a toddler, or like three or four, encounter. This man named Carmody Brack, uh, who owns a bric-a-brac shop, and he's very unsettling. And he ends up stamping Jacko's hand with a stamp with Carmody's face on it. And that's a little weird, huh? And yeah. then Jacko, very, in short order, becomes very sick. He, he's very clearly not well. And Laura's like, okay, that was my warning. That was what I was, you know, I was trying to stop it, but I didn't know what to look for. His health deteriorates to the point where he has to go to the hospital. She's trying to tell, Laura's trying to tell her mom, I know what the cause of this was. It was this weird dude who put a stamp on Jacko's hand and it's like some sort of curse. And, you know, I don't know what's going on here. And of course, her mother, Kate, is not going to be like, oh, yeah, okay. It's the curse. <laughs> it's the from stamp the curse, man. <laughs> <laughs> which has sunk into his skin now. You can't even see it anymore. And Laura decides because no one's listening to her, which is also an interesting thing, because like you said, teenage girls sort of sensitivity and emotions, and they just aren't taken seriously. So if Laura has warning that something bad is going to happen and she tells her mom and, and she isn't listened to even lovingly and benignly, like when she comes back with an even more outlandish story about some dude with a stamp, no one's going to listen to her then either. But the doctors can't figure out what's going on. And so Laura decides, okay, I suspect that this prefect at my school, Sorensen Carlisle, is a witch because he just, he just is. <laughs> <laughs> He's weird. She just can sort of see through him. She knows that he has persona and she knows that what's going on behind him is just always sort of winking at her. She can see through his facade and knows that he is a witch somehow. And she goes to the Sorensen, to the, to the Carlisle house and says, hey, you're a witch. Please help me save my brother. And that is our first introduction to to Sori, who I will talk about more in a bit, but I want to get through this a little. She decides all of this on her own. She's going to go to the Carlisles, which has got to be a weird thing. She goes from her relatively poor area to the Carlisles, who live on like this um, beautiful property that has been a part of the city, if not the country, for a long time. And um, goes into this teen boy's like room to ask him to help her save her little brother from a curse. And she knows he's a witch and he doesn't take it super well. Let's just put it that way. He doesn't help her. I love to be accused of witchcraft. Every day, every night. Yeah, I I can't imagine, like, thinking from Sori's perspective, he's a teen boy who has this weird rapport with this this girl at his school, and she shows up at his house (laughs) and is like, I know you're a witch. Were I a witch, I would feel sort of similar to that about how I, I do when people just sort of like go like, oh, so you're you're queer, huh? I'd be like, I mean, yeah, but like... What do you want? <laughs> Not I get for to you. come out to you as a witch. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> exactly. You don't get to assume just because I kind of seem like a witch. Especially because in the context of the scene, Sori thinks that she's there for flirtatious reasons because they kind of have like attention. And he assumes that she showed up at his room to I like you or whatever. And instead she's like, you're a witch. Okay, do you want, like, contraceptive potions or love po- Like, I don't do love potions. What do you need, Chant? No, my little brother got stamped, and he's sick now, and he's like, okay, take him to the doctor. And uh, anyway, sorry, won't help her. But uh, eventually, he does actually encounter Jacko and finds out, yeah, no, he's he's a witch. Or, he's, he, he's a witch, too. He's a witch. Jacko's a witch. I'm a witch. Everybody's a witch. E- eventually, sorry does find out that she 
is correct that he has been essentially cursed and sorry unhelpfully tells her like oh he's sealing up there's nothing to be done for it and laura's sorry. like um so what are we gonna do to save my little bro like come on dude you're a witch you gotta have something and eventually what comes about is that laura herself might be able to save him if she takes on a magical changeover hence the title and becomes a witch herself like she's the only one who can do it sorry can't the carlisles can't they can help her become a witch but they can't help her with anything else and that's essentially the plot laura chant 14 year old girl whom apparently nobody listens to or takes seriously, <laughs> goes on a quest to save her little brother from the bad guy, is aided by the Carlisle family and is aided by her potential love interest, Sori, who's a weird witch of his own. So the dynamic with Sori is interesting and is something that I will be talking about a lot, but I want to talk right now about what the changeover does with its fairy tale and mythic elements, because it is not indirect about what it's doing and how it's not shying away from the fact that it's incorporating those. There are a lot of literary references. In fact, in one of the essays I read about the book, um, which I will link in the show notes, it specifically talks about how the language Laura uses, the references she makes start out as like children's literature and folktales. And then as she matures, quote unquote, throughout the book and um, undergoes the changeover, she switches to more adults and um, she switches to more adult references, um, which I think is a cool choice and such a subtle one. Like, I didn't notice that, but clearly, you know, I didn't sit down to write an academic article about it. <laughs> Until this podcast. Until this podcast. Welcome to my PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> so first and foremost, the, Car the Carlisles are uh, Winter, Miriam, and Sori. Winter is the grandma. Miriam is the mother, is, is Sori's mother. And obviously there's Sori, the male witch, who is unusual. That is not standard thing in this universe. And they are, of course, the, the old woman, the mother, and the maiden. Laura is meant to be the maiden if she undergoes this changeover because obviously Sori can't be for reasons. <laughs> He's not a, a woman. <laughs> he is a dude, even if he is a male witch. Let Sori be a maiden if he wants to be. I mean, I'll talk about this more in the Sori section, which is in quotes. Or bold, at least. Sori is a, a misfit, obviously. And that one of the reasons why is because they assumed having given birth to a male child that he would be of no use to them magically. But he is. Let Sori help. He's a good Let boy. <laughs> He's powerful. You know, we have these traditional witchy elements like the maiden, the mother, and the crone. We also have allusions to the, ho ho the holy. Mm -hmm. We have allusions to the holy grail. We have tarot symbols. We have... Laura's virginity is key. They even ask her at one point, are you a virgin? And she's just like, the fuck? Yes, also. <laughs> <laughs> Laura's just like, um. And Miriam says, you know, we ha we must marry you if we can to some sleeping aspect of yourself. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're a virgin. It's just like certain parts of this are easier if you are because you aren't as attached to the final form of yourself, which is an interesting way to look kind at it. Kind of a weird vibe. It's kind of a weird vibe, but it wasn't like oh no, we can't do this unless you're a virgin. It's just like, I just kind of need no for the ritual. If you are a virgin, we're going to do it this way. But if you're not, we're going to do it another way, which is nice because it really could have been like super shamey. Her virginity is key in that at one point she literally fixes a barren landscape and brings it back to life by like renewing the earth. She's just like, I will direct this barren landscape to be lush and fertile again. And I'm just like, oh boy, <laughs> love those fertile landscape. At one point, um, Sori is described as having looking glass eyes. In fact, several times his eyes are referred to in those sort of very specific Lewis Carroll kind of ways. Sori calls her Cinderella at one point, which is a class reference given their class difference. Yeah, Sori's occasionally a a shithead hold out for that she walks into his room and it's described as like beautiful fatima into bluebeard's chamber the ones that are most overt are things like when the changeover begins miriam has laura pr prick her finger for a drop of blood into mulled wine which she drinks miriam ponders if sleeping beauty after pricking her finger had sucked it after and um mm -hmm. and i think the the big key here is laura herself is not experiencing a sleeping curse she is Taking that fairy tale reference, which was called out by the book, by the Sleeping Beauty pricking her finger thing, she is going into a dreamland and is not a passive participant, which I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. And then there's a major part while she's 
in the midst of the changeover where she's seeing a lot of figures from from myth and fairy tale. Um, she sees, quote, beautiful girls who had committed themselves to silence in order to save brothers turned into swans or ravens, young men who thrived with sunshine and dwindled with darkness. So she's literally seeing characters out of six swans and 12 brothers. She sees the three bears, the girl in the red hood. And the interesting thing here, which again, like I didn't realize it until I was going back and doing research and rereading the book for the 80th time that she is literally pushing against the traditional fairy tale narrative. And at one point, like they're all moving in an opposite direction from her. Mm -hmm. She is going one way. They are going another. They are taking one traditional path. She is forging her fucking own because Laura Chant is a boss. While she's pushing against that traditional fairy tale narrative, she literally feels herself pushing through an intangible resistance. So the path that she is treading is brand new, is a subversion of everything that came before it. And I really like that. I really think that Laura's agency is a huge part of why this book is so important to me. Because mm -hmm. not only are we dealing with, I love a, a witchcraft book, especially if it's about a teen teen girl, like I'm always there for that. There's something magical about it, no pun intended. But the idea that Laura is such an active participant in this, she is the hero. She is saving um, somebody else. She is not the love interest. She is going into places where characters in literature of her gender normally do not go. Yeah, I really enjoyed the last time we talked about this. I'm, I just love... The fact that this takes something that is so, like, traditionally tied to, like, it's not an unfamiliar narrative, right? Like, mm -hmm. teen girl becomes witch through entering puberty. These things are inextricably linked. But I, I love that it's something that is her choice yes. in this scenario. Like, this is something that she is actively saying, like, I'm going to do this because I want to claim the power inherent in growing up and becoming a more powerful version of myself rather than like this corruption, which is what puberty is sort of traditionally framed as, particularly for women as like, oh, you're growing up and you're getting wily yeah. <laughs> and bad. It's it's a source of power and it's a source of personal agency rather than uh, just like, uh-oh, you're getting to the sexy age. Exactly. And one of the other things that the the novel plays with is, and I think that very smartly because Lauren and, and Sori's relationship as it develops is very interesting, but it could really easily step into those shoes of Sori is part of her sexual awakening. And he is in some ways. And at one point she even pushes to have sex with him and he turns her down because he realizes that like it wasn't from a like pure place of consent. It was out of like a rage response to something else. And he's just like, oh, sorry. When he makes good choices, he makes good choices. It could so easily become something about how, like, she falls in love with Sori and becomes a sexual being or whatever. And that's mm -hmm. not, not how she is experiencing this changeover. On the side, she is having a bit of a an adult, like, sexual awakening. I mean, she is 14. So, like, you know, take that with a grain of salt. She's still a child. But... She is understanding attraction and the power that she has in her own sexual attra attractiveness over him. But also, this is the thing about her. Laura is not here to talk about having, like, an affair with Sori. She is here to save her brother. She is mm -hmm. like Katniss in the fucking Hunger Games. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's like, that's nice, but my little sister and also I want to get out of this fucking arena like thanks Peta, but wait <laughs> yeah like thanks but like let's deal with this later even though nothing is ever that simple laura's priorities are clear in this book and mahi never crosses the line between her burgeoning expression of sexuality and her burgeoning relationship with sori they aren't what activates her witchiness if you look at witchiness as her puberty she chooses to enter this puberty she chooses to enter this awakening it isn't something that she fell into or that was thrust upon her or something that she activated because she slept with him like like this isn't this isn't that story and the story goes out of its way to acknowledge that by having her literally give that as an option by by offering to sleep with sori and Sori is just like, let's not do that, actually. <laughs> One, you're a little bit younger than me. And two, this is not, you don't actually want this. Let's chill. Sori's role, as I mentioned, because he is not obviously one of the, the maiden, the mother of the crone, and Laura is supposed to fill that maiden role. He is an odd duck, right? He is the window <laughs> she has into witchiness. He's also uh, the gatekeep gatekeeper at school, which is interesting. He shepherds students inside 
the halls of the school. And he's also the gatekeeper in her changeover ritual, which I like. I like how Mar- Margaret Mahi is clearly just like, what if it's like a layer yeah, cake. Yeah, it's literally just a like layer cake. <laughs> metaphor re- ground floor. <laughs> metaphor floor two. <laughs> metaphor floor three. It's like, if I can put it in here three times, I fucking will. Which I respect. This is actually going to make a great uh, bridging episode to my next episode, which is about another author who really, really (laughs) enjoys metaphors. (laughs) I love that it's all come full circle. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about witchcraft as puberty in fiction when it comes to girls in particular. I'm sure most people are kind of familiar with this, even if they don't think of it in those terms. When you start thinking about stories about teen girls who are witches or encounter some sort of witchcraft or even things like the exorcist which is not strictly speaking about witchcraft but reagan the main character is 13 when she's basically about to hit puberty when she's possessed by a demon and there are a lot of things going on there that could be (laughs) she's going through she's acting wild she's acting vulgar she's acting grotesque hey guess what she's 13 years old yeah, I remember um, a good friend of mine who hadn't seen The Exorcist, like, when it came out, going back to watch it and being like, yeah, I get that this is a classic of the horror genre, but it is hard to return to this if you're somebody who is not afraid of teen girls. Exactly! <laughs> because it is so, like, and there's so much of horror um, that is framed around fear of women mm-hmm. and fear and disgust, I, I would say, that is especially targeted at at teen girls kind of coming into themselves and coming into their again coming into their power but also like changing in ways that are not necessarily they're messy yeah it's and and the obnoxious thing of course is that that's also true for people of any gender it's a it's a messy half grown up half a child time but it gets particularly targeted at teen girls as this time of like oh you're just a hot mess right now Mm mm-hmm and then the the monsterification of that, I think, is something you see in horror a lot, where it's like, what if that, but like also with like rivers of blood. <laughs> <laughs> That's why some of my examples are are so like on the same um, level as that. Carrie's an example of that. She comes into mm-hmm. powers basically after getting her period. There's a lot in that book and in the movie about girls getting their period and her sort of reaction to having gotten these powers is to use them to punish people who have treated her poorly and it's like men interpret menstruation the (laughs) horror movie stephen king we are calling you the fuck out (laughs) carrie's actually a good book nothing against carrie in particular i just think there is a whole genre of fiction that could be summarized that way there are so many books about the uh, i don't know there's two ways to look at puberty right one as getting your period and quote unquote becoming a woman <laughs> and two as becoming sexually <laughs> mature or at least sexually presu- pre- presumed to be sexually mature and sexually available to other people <laughs> and yeah. um, We're, if in case <laughs> we, my our gagging is air quotes. Quotes. these are gross <laughs> and bad ideas <laughs> They're all bad, but they are historic and they are a huge part of our culture. So we have stories like The Exorcist. We have stories like Carrie. We even have stories that are a little on the nose, like The Craft. Um, I'm sure you have not seen that. It's a movie from the 90s about this coven of teenage girls who basically dabbles with witchcraft to gain agency and gain power to get what they want. One of whom uses it to escape like poverty and the other of whom uses it to heal wounds that she has and another uses it. They use it to help themselves, but they also eventually use it as weapons and it like corrupts some of them. And like, there's a whole thing there of just like, oh, okay. So, (laughs) so women having agency over their own lives can like lead to corruption and evilness. Okay, I see what's going on here. We even have stuff like the the Netflix remake of Sabrina the Teenage Witch called The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, where Sabrina at uh, 16 faces a choice of she's half human, half witch. And um, this type of witch is definitely in league with Satan. This is ascribed directly to Satan signing a contract with Satan. She has to decide, you know, which what world she will live in. Will she become a witch and go to the school and only associate with other witches and Satan? Or will she stay in the human world and like love her mortal boyfriend and like it's it's very clearly split and this is sort of like okay well will you will you still stay like an innocent girl or will you become like a sexy evil lady like (laughs) (laughs) so you can see it fucking everywhere the minute you start realizing that puberty is used as a metaphor or that witchcraft is used as a metaphor for power sexual availability or even just 
getting your period, things get weird. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, femininity, historically, um, I was reading an article about, it's called uh, The Real Women, The Real Women. <laughs> yep. The Real <laughs> Reason Women Love Witches. And it was basically talking about, um, I'll just quote this. Here we go. European Christian women in late antiquity in the Middle Ages were generally barred access to institutional power, and thus women who expressed their religiosity in unapproved ways, or in ways that were, quote, too feminine by the standards of the culture, were branded as witches or heretics. The article goes on to say that, um, thus the people who had a vested interest in those institutions began to pay neurotically close attention to anything that looked, quote, too feminine, and expanded the significance of feminine symbols, like the broom, an ordinary domestic tool, to include dangerous associations, for example, flying at night to secret meetings. Because if a woman looked like she was seizing spiritual power that wasn't hers by right, then everything, quote, feminine about her, uh, I think this is a typo, became suspect and morally charged. <laughs> it said because, and I was like, mm, no. And I think that that, I, I haven't actually spent a ton of time academically researching the history of persecution of witches uh, um, throughout the ages. Like I have a very broad understanding of that, but I think- You have approximate knowledge of many witches. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> approximate knowledge of many witches, the title of this episode. Also, I'm taking you to witch church. <gasps> Take me to Wurch. <laughs> Take me to Wurch. <laughs> in a lot of traditional media and even in the changeover, becoming a woman, and I'm putting like tilds around that, like is becoming a witch, as trite and reductive as that is. Gaining power and gaining agency, and in many cases, gaining awareness of sexuality is magic and frequently coded as evil. <laughs> I love that that sort of progression. You're like, oh, it's magic. Oh, it's Satan. Satan gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why, like, I love witch stories because I really love people using whatever tools are at their disposal. And also, who mm -hmm. doesn't love magic aside from like Puritans? <laughs> Listen, from I'm I'm no great fan of menstruating. <laughs> like. <laughs> Not, you know, not to make anyone else's choice of them, just personally for me was not a fan. But if I'd gotten like powers, sick magic out of it, I might be like, all right, I'll bleed every well, day. Fuck this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> it makes it more of a trade off. Yeah, it does. It feels like you get something out of it aside from I, fertility. Yeah, because I, the thing that would set me off more than anything as as a teen who was perceived as a teen girl uh, was like when you would get that sort of like, ah, uh, and now you are connected with your uh, true feminine self. And it, this is a time of wonder and, <laughs> and like beautiful improvements to your body. And I was like, listen, I'm getting jack shit. This out is of a this shitty biological function that I don't want. There is nothing about this that is improving my existence <laughs> thank you very much that's not the case for everybody but i imagine for you who was sort of <laughs> wrongly presumed to be something you were not it was especially yeah. excruciating it was just kind of like hey not really though <laughs> and so if it had been in fact like actually like you can fly oh fuck yeah and it would be like oh oh well all right yeah, it's like we're waiting fair, for this, fair deal. this great moment. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I can, I can fly I, now. Yeah, I can talk to magic cats now. <laughs> All right. I'm going to just cool. call the wind a little bit. The thing about the changeover that's remarkable, and I guess this is true of the craft as well. Like, this is a choice Laura made. This wasn't like she woke up one day and had her period and was like, I'm a witch. Or like, this wasn't she slept with Sori and was like, I have power now. This was, my little brother is in danger. I am going to save him. And to do that, I have to go on this very specific magical quest to turn into a witch. And love I love that. <laughs> no, love it. I love good. it. It's good. It's nice. It's nice, sweet. Solid. Good. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Join us next week. So, <laughs> um, anyway, I have a little tiny. Thanks, Margaret. <laughs> Thanks, Good Judy show. Bloom. Um, so <laughs> I'm surprised Judy Bloom, as far as I know, did not write any books about little uh, young women turning into witches. Yeah, not as far as I know. As far as I know, no. Well, 
I mean, she did write, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, which was important. Frequently, when you're looking at that transition and that puberty, like girls are seen as old enough to be sexualized, usually by much older men and are not Mm -hmm. given any agency, which is like, that's to a certain degree, like that's fair. Kids and teens are not fully grown. They're not baked all the way yet. They don't have, they shouldn't have complete agency over their lives. And they're beholden to a system of authority figures. And some of that is reasonable. But there is something especially insidious about places where people, especially older men, are deciding that they are sexually available objects. And so having these stories where young women seize power that isn't because of men or that allows them to engage in sexuality on their own terms instead of on the terms of grown-ass fucking men is great, even though we also have a lot of negative sides of that, which is like power and sexual agency is scary and slutty or Mm -hmm. evil even. Yeah. But honestly, like, I'll take that over no power. I'll take scary, slutty evil (laughs) over literally no agency and no power. (laughs) Like... I'll take that any day. Sure, yeah, I'm an envoy of Satan because I have boobs or whatever. Any amount of giving teen girls power I am fond of. And I am relieved and delighted that in this story, it wasn't because Laura had to be a sexual being. And it wasn't about that. It was it was completely incidental to her journey. Yeah, it's like uh, something that I remember we we talked about in the last episode too that I like is that it, it doesn't feel like trade-off with positives and negatives so much as it is a trade-off of choices that she gets to make. Again, coming back to that agency, but like also in terms of like, are you a virgin or not? Whatever. It's fine. It's fine. We'll make or, it work. like, are you going to be a witch or not? Whatever. It's fine. It's it's not so often that sort of process is A, involuntary, but it's also one with these huge strings attached of life. Like, you can have this, but... At the cost uh, of... At the cost of your your purity or whatever. And in this, it's like, yeah, you can you can leave that behind or you can take it with you. That's just down to, like, who you are as a person. This is about the journey that you're going on, not an inherent uh, value statement. Yeah. About people who go on these journeys. Exactly. And it's like, even though they're acknowledging, like, when they ask her if she's a virgin, clearly that can have an impact on the outcome. Again, there's no value assigned to that. They're just like, either you are or you aren't, and we're going to deal with it. Um, They do, the, the Carlisle family is a little bit upfront about what it means to be a witch and like, hey, it's actually kind of lonely. There aren't a lot of us and your life will change. The way you see things will change. Like you really do want to think about this. There is a a cost and it's leaving that old life behind. This isn't like, and then you sign the, the fucking line in blood and you're married to Satan. Like it's not, and then you have to fuck a demon. Like it's very much... The way that you look at the world will change. Your contemporaries will change. This isn't undoable. You can only cross over once. This is not hinged on her virginity. It is not hinged on her sexuality. It is not hinged on evil. It's hinged on how do you want to live your life. Do you want to do this or do you want to not? If Laura hadn't decided to do this, and it was apparently a dangerous thing for her to do. Like, if Mm -hmm. she hadn't decided to do this, could she have saved her brother? Probably not. So it was incredibly, like, the stakes were high. It's a fraught choice. It's a very fraught choice. This is not something that I think she could have very easily said no to, but but it would have been reasonable for her to say no. Because becoming a witch is not easy and is not reversible and is not, you know, something that everybody would want. And also, she could have doubted that it was real. She really could have. And that is one Mm. of the things that there's an extra edge to that where it's like, if a teen girl tells you something, are you going to believe her? And so when she's telling her mother that she has premonitions and that she knows what happened to Jacko and no one's listening to her, it's like, that rings real to me as someone who was a teen girl. My experience of the world and my judgment of the world was in question, even even if that does sound outlandish, like, yeah, there was a dude who hurt my brother supernaturally. You should at least maybe have a deeper conversation with your daughter. (laughs) than being like (laughs) hey no um this is because of whatever anyway yeah i really like the changeover for what it does and now i'm going to use this time to talk about Sorensen carlisle because i have done a good job (laughs) of not doing that till now and i love him tell us about your your boy i tell you about my boy the book will go into this much more beautifully and painfully than i can the reason i think 
story works so well in this book is because he is going through a transformation the same way that Laura is. And he has a choice to make about who he wants to be the same way that Laura does. And he's a bit of an outsider as well. I mean, he's he's a male heir to a family of witches and is a witch himself. And he he has a history of like parental abandonment. abandonment. He was sent by the Carlisles to another family when he was born because they were like, oh, you're a male. You're a male. What are we going to do with you? Like, you don't have the power that we want. And he has a history of trauma and baggage. And he uses um, coping mechanisms like depersonalization and the lack of access to emotions to work through. And one of the the underlying thing with, with him is like the Carlisles are very gentle with him. They're not a particularly like... They, I think they literally say we are a fond family, not a loving one or something like that. So, so, mm. so like civility and politeness is very important to us. And so they're being very careful to give Sori the appearance of and the habits of someone who is conscientious, even if he is himself not because of his trauma and the way that that is given him not a lot of access to his emotions. Like he's trying so hard to understand human emotion. He's trying hard to understand sentiment. He's trying hard. Like he reads romance novels to try and figure out what love is and how romance works. (laughs) I love him. He's just a weird boy and I love him so much. And she's right. Um, when, when Laura first thinks about him and thinks about how she knows he's a witch She's like, okay, he's pretending every minute of every day. He, it's like he's making a list of th- he think things he thinks humans should do and ticking it off one by one, including like when she remembers like, oh, yeah, he buys romance novels. Like, what the fuck is that? And you find out it's because he's trying to figure out like how humans do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like that his essentially the Carlisles are being very gentle with him and trying to instill in him humanity and civility and kindness and some amount of emotion, even though these these women are very clearly not emotional. And that's one of the reasons why they're eager for Lori. Lori? <laughs> that's their ship name. That's why they're <laughs> eager for Laura to be associated with Sori and to sort of join their coven, I guess, is I don't think they refer to it as a coven, but Yeah, I was gonna ask, do they are they a coven? I don't know. I think maybe they mentioned coven once, but they don't really use that terminology a lot. They want Laura to become a witch and help them in their witchy quest. The one of the other reasons she, they want Laura around is because basically nine times out of 10, witches who turn bad are ones who do not have access to love and kindness. And so they're mm. really worried literally for Sori's soul. They do not want him to turn into a bad witch because of what happened to him. And they're hoping that not only can Laura become a witch and help them with their witchy deeds, but also can help humanize Sori. And like, that's not Laura's fucking job. Mm-hmm. Laura's like, hey, 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 my bro. And also that really sucks about Sori. And I like Sori and like we have a thing kind of going on here. That's not Laura's job. <laughs> yeah. It's not Laura's job. And and so one of the things that Sori is trying to decide throughout the book is whether or not he wants to invest. Because he's realizing like anytime he has to deal with emotions, he's just like, this is exhausting and hard. Like, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. <laughs> Listen, we've all been there. I know. I was like, mm, hashtag relatable. So yeah, the dynamic between them is just so exquisitely like teenage and good. And the supernatural elements of the existence of witches and the fact that Laura's sensitive and that Sori is just, he's an extra boy. Not only is he just a, a weird little baggage ridden witchy boy, he's also like when she shows up at his house. He's wearing like a velvet robe and he's yes. the ringed and he's got like his black hat on his lap and he's just like, Mwah. like he, he has like a, a picture of a naked lady on his wall and he's just like, look at my art. And then there's like also a picture he took of Laura, like pinned up with it. And Laura's just like, the fuck is wrong with you, creep? What are you? Uh, so every weird thing about Sori and every, every challenging, strange thing about him really adds to the teenage dynamic where everything just feels so intense when you're that young because it's the first time you've ever really experienced it and your hormones are like god knows what they're doing yeah (laughs) they're flooding you they're like i don't know what's this what's this emotion Mm." that combined with the heightened stakes of like my brother is dying and i'm the only one who can save him by becoming a literal witch means that they're attraction and their teenage flirtation and their dynamic is so much more intense and I love that. I love that you take something that could be on paper, like just a, a boy and girl flirting and like, mm, it could be a very traditional YA element, but it's so heightened and so exquisitely teenagery, at least to me. And I also love that she isn't particularly sidelined by it, like I said. Mm-hmm. Obviously, this is something that she's dealing with, but she's like, hey, my brother? <laughs> 
Yeah. Hey. My brother who I must save. Thank you. <laughs> She's not really distracted. Like, yeah, she has human moments, but like no one can can live in I say this as someone who has lived through like medical emergencies and family death and, and stuff like that. Like stuff where you're consumed by the emergency. It's like not every mm-hmm. single second is dedicated to that. Sometimes you'll like watch a television show or sometimes you'll like have a fight with your significant other. Other things happen. And so she's got her goal and she's focused on that goal. But also like Sori's weird and cute. She might want to kiss him a little. Hey. Um, even as he's like challenging her with his own overtures and his own intrigue, he helps her. He helps her a- access her witchiness. And I don't know. I love that. And um, to wrap this up, because we are getting a little long, I wanted to talk about the movie adaptation. Drag it. I'm going to drag it to hell. I'm going to drag it real bad. <laughs> I know you are. Because <laughs> you listened to this last because time. Because I've, I've listened to this and also seen your show notes. Please <laughs> I feel like unkind because it it was an independent movie made in New Zealand by, you know, New Zealanders who clearly like knew that this book was important to people. But in the changes that they made, they like didn't understand what was good about the book. (laughs) And maybe they just didn't know how they were going to translate shit to screen. Like maybe they realized that. You know, I'm giving them credit here. You know, the the part I mentioned where she sees characters out of myth and fiction, literally the girl in the red hood maybe they realize that that isn't the most cinematic thing that it works better on the page so they were like okay well we're gonna divorce the fairy tale element from it and make it i feel like they could have this is you've been kind and i'm gonna be unkind uh, having not (laughs) seen the film and having no skin in this game i feel like they could have done something like uh jim henson-ish like do some do labyrinth Oh, like fuck, stuff, yeah. you know, like if you don't have the CGI budget, go with freaky puppets. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Even if they had put in freaky some like illusions, puppets. I would have, I mean, I would have loved some freaky puppets, but they didn't do any of that. They essentially, the, the sequence I'm mentioning, I'm not going to spoil this, but there's no hint of fairy tale in it. It's more mm. fraught. It's more about Laura standing outside of her own life, trying to, they essentially give, okay, Carmody, the, the demon thing that's inhabiting her brother and draining his life forces to sustain his own is given more of a role in this movie as like yes that's what he's doing but it's also more like a serial killer who kills children specifically and that's great yeah and so it's like very different i did not think that was the best choice because one of the other things that this movie did was downplay the actual witchcraft of the book for example the carlisles are meant to be like their home their dynamic their roles as as mother and crone and then sorry in his weird room which is like a study where he's wearing like a velvet robe um <laughs> like these are all things that are meant to be othered and meant to be windows into an alternate like they're meant to be the thing that she could become the thing that's tempting her they're the they're strange and witchy and they know too much and that's not really present in the film and they also criminally underutilized lucy lawless who plays miriam <gasps> How do you sin? Yeah. How do you not like put Lucy Lawless in every scene and just have her be like a mysterious witch? Uh, we've talked about a lot of things that aren't evil in this episode. <laughs> that is though. I want witchy Lucy Lawless. That is satanic. It is. <laughs> to have Lucy Lawless and underutilize her. No offense to Satan, who I'm sure would not underutilize Lucy Lawless given the chance. Satan would understand what he needs to do. By making it a modern film in the aftermath of the Christchurch earthquake. In the in the 1984 book, the chants are just poor and they don't like they don't have a phone, their car doesn't start easily. Like they're they're struggling to make ends meet. And in this case, it's like their family was literally shattered by like they're the only house on their block, basically. Mm-hmm. And so to have that juxtaposed with the Carlisles live in like this very modern looking house in a nice part of town. I don't know that much about New Zealand. Sorry. Sori's room is encased in like glass sliding doors and windows instead of being like old and witchy and like surrounded by a garden and a wrought iron fence and like part of the land. This is like, oh, no, they're just wealthy. And Mm, Sori mm -hmm. doesn't isn't surrounded by romance novels. And also no no offense to this actor. um, I think his name's uh, Nicholas something so this actor like did a perfectly <laughs> adequate job as sorry but sorry is portrayed as like witchy and blonde like he's blonde and weird and this is just like a handsome dark-haired boy 
I was like, you don't get it. <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> you don't understand how badly people need to fall in love with this weird blonde boy with his fucking cat and his rings. There's a part where he says in the book, um, I'm my most myself at home. Uh, by the time I get to school, I barely exist or something like that. And I like that. I like that when he's in his element, he's like this weird little witchy, like he's basically a cartoon character. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like they sort of drained a lot of the personality Mm -hmm. out of a lot of aspects of the book in favor of telling kind of a different story. more straightforward. Uh, And it's weird because it's, okay, yeah, she's still doing a changeover to save her brother who's like been cursed, essentially. Oh, also in the movie, this is one thing they did that I thought was cool to give the movie credit. Um, In the movie, her brother needs a bone marrow transplant, I believe. Yeah. And Laura's the only match. And so in the movie, she's having to weigh, do I do this changeover? Is this real? Do I undergo this dangerous changeover or do i just give him my bone marrow so this i like that i like that there was like a quote-unquote real world element that was also pressing instead of just like i can only do this one thing and maybe it'll save jacko and this was like i have two options one of them is rooted in real life quote-unquote and the other one is rooted in witchcraft and i have to decide if i trust myself and if i trust this witchcraft is real but it's like if you're undercutting the witchcraft at every fucking turn by removing the witchiness of these characters by removing the otherworldliness of these characters what choice is that anyway yeah Eh. yeah i don't know i I like that there's it's more mysterious in the movie and that there's no like clear-cut one-way solution and the casting of um irana james as laura is actually quite good oh and one thing i forgot to mention about laura that is actually important although not in the huge in the book is that she has um maori ancestry on her dad's side um she is explicitly described with woolly hair and olive skin and i like that i like that she isn't a white character and there's some aspects of even in the changeover there's a few aspects of like potentially Maori folklore and, and myth and heritage in there. And I thought that was cool. And I, I meant to mention it at the beginning of the episode, but I forgot. Casting was good. I liked the choice to give Laura a, a an anchored in the real world option to save her brother. But they completely like took all of the flavor out of the witchcraft, the Sorensen character, <laughs> my boy, and the Carlisles. And then they also, they just made the the whole vibe a little bit darker in some ways by having this essentially be about Carmendy as a dark figure and a killer and kidnapper and drainer of children. And during the changeover, Laura is seeing her life from the outside rather than going on a more traditional, like, I'm walking through fairy tale shit journey. I know what they were going for. It was a swing and a miss. If you're gonna adapt the changeover, a supernatural romance <laughs> by <Yeah>. Margaret Mai. <laughs> Maybe you just need to resign yourself to the fact that it's going to be supernatural. <laughs> yeah, I I think, I feel like we've talked about this. I don't know if we've talked about it on a podcast before, but gosh, I feel like the number one thing that bothers me with adaptations is when they don't respect the source material. Mm-hmm. Like, it's fine to make changes because I think there are a lot of really powerful adaptations that are quite different. But when you don't grasp the core of why people love that thing and you just go for like, what if we did this, but gritty and therefore better? Never, never works. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but this is actually very key and I'm going to spoil the movie, not the book, more than I already have. So uh, skip ahead, I guess, if you want to see the movie somehow. Um, So the ending (laughs) of the actual movie, which has nothing to do with the book, is literally a scene of Laura showing up in a cute sundress at, at Sori's room in his house and like jumping into bed with him. Okay, that's a weird thing to do. And I was like, look, I get that you're trying to give this like a cute, they're a couple now ending and it's kind of sweet. Maybe they're falling into the trap. She's become a witch. She's accept her accepted her womanhood now. So she has to fuck her boyfriend. Like, that's not the point of the book. It's explicitly not. <laughs> to end it Oof. on that was like, ooh, especially because I don't know if they aged her up in the movie it's possible she's like 16 but like laura chan is 14 years old guys yeah she's a baby yikes i don't even know if it meant that she had sex with him but i have to say jumping into bed with your boyfriend seems kind of sexy she could have just kissed him this was another thing where i was like did you get why this book was good i would have watched an entire second movie of laura chant being a witch with her like weird boyfriend 
kind of boyfriend. Hanging out with the Carlisles and like going home. And I, I get it. You make changes. I disagree with them. Also, sorry to anyone who is involved with the making of the changeover movie who <laughs> listens to this. Um, didn't mean to shit all over your creation, but listen, there's a I reason mean, I love Amanda this Amanda did mean to shit all over your creation, <laughs> but she doesn't want you to feel bad about it. <laughs> I don't want you to know that I don't like your movie. It was so, it was like one of those things where it was so close and so far hey, away. Hey, no, Amanda, just put this back like five minutes ago. If you were involved in the making of the changeover movie, skip ahead <laughs> to the end of the episode. <laughs> don't listen to this because it's not nice. <laughs> um, and I felt that really bad because like I was so excited when they announced they were making a movie about the changeover. I was like, oh, an adaptation of a thing I love that I think would make a really good movie. And then I like the first thing I saw was that like Lucy Lawless was in it and i was like oh "Oh." yeah you see you were super hyped timothy spall was playing carmody brack and i was like oh that's a good cast choice there and then uh, timothy spall played uh, peter pettigrew in the harry potter films Hmm. and then like i saw that sorry was not a blonde and i was like that's fine (laughs) they can make changes (laughs) listen (laughs) we've all seen a brunette character like actor put in a blonde wig and it doesn't always look good so i was fine with that but then but then i saw it and i was like they don't understand what makes this Anyway, there was my great PowerPoint presentation on the changeover and how it handled subverting fairy tales and folklore and myth and also how it subverted the very popular trope as magical transformation as puberty slash womanhood and how the movies didn't do a good job at any of that. <laughs> Thank you for restating your thesis. You're welcome. You see what I did there? I, like, I got a reiteration in conclusion. <laughs> I have full points. Um, uh, full points. A plus plus. Also, uh, as a as a as a incentive to get people to read The Changeover by Margaret Mahi, it's like five bucks on Amazon Kindle US, and I'm gonna do a giveaway of two copies. So if you I was have... literally about to say, if you mention it to Amanda, she'll probably buy it for you. Oh, so. I bought it for like six people it's fine i'm gonna do a post on um twitter with uh, like a giveaway like i'll randomly pick two people but if you retweet it i will and you live in the u.s i will buy you a kindle copy of the changeover because it's real good um so if you want to talk to me about the changeover you can do so on twitter you can talk to the official account which is at red pen pod or you can talk to me which is at amanda h jean and i am at austin chanted with a d uh, I don't know that much about the changeover, but um, I'll finish the book and, and then if then you, you want to tag me in your conversations <laughs> with Amanda, you can do that if you want, I guess. I'll just tag everyone I bought the book for and just be like, let's all chat right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you are so inclined, we have a Patreon for uh, our show and for our general podcasting enterprise. Uh, if you can chip in a couple bucks, it really helps us out. And you can get access to all kinds of fun bonus features uh, and different pledge levels. You can do stuff like prompt us to talk about, you know, literally whatever whatever you want. Literally anything. And I I said initially when I made the tier, I was like, we'll talk for 10 minutes. Yeah, no, you're going to get a lot more than 10 minutes. Unless you're like, talk to us about astrophysics. Oh, we'd I'd still do I'm, it. We'd find a way. <laughs> I'd find an. I'd find an angle. <laughs> I'll slowly, seductively read the entire Wikipedia page on astrophysics if you want to. <laughs> would that be fair use? Um, if you do a funny a voice, question. maybe it would I'll be parody. I'll read the entire Wikipedia page on copyright law. <laughs> <laughs> seductively. So sign up for that. Give us money for that. Oh, also, we um, if you are interested, you can email us to purchase a sponsorship because we do sponsorships now because we're a real podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk about your thing. It's real cheap right now. So and what's the email address at which they can email us, Amanda? That's a good question, Austin Chant. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> I was I pointedly didn't say it like a silly person. All right. I'm f- is it red pen pod? It is red pen pod at gmail dot com. You can email us. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Red Pen. And as usual, if you love something, you gotta cut it up.